I'm Temporary Chief Inspector Toby Fawcett Greaves of Derbyshire Constabulary, and I was the Senior Investigating Officer uh, in charge of the investigation. On the morning of the 13th of December 2018, Derbyshire Police received a call from East Midlands Ambulance Service reporting that they had been called to attend an address in South Normanton. They had some concerns around the circumstances. First responders are called to the home of Keeney McGrath, Anthony, Tony Davis and their three children. According to Tony, Keeley's been in a terrible accident. Tony Davis had come home in the early hours of the morning and found that Keeley had fallen down the stairs and sustained a series of injuries as a result. Keeley and Tony live in a small village just outside Bolsover in Derbyshire, England. Very quickly, the neighbours believe something is wrong. I got loads of missed calls saying that there was loads of police and everything up at the house. And I just walked downstairs to my stepdad and said, Keely will be dead when I get there. At the house, police begin locking down the scene. Management of the crime scene really involves getting everybody out. We've got a number of people present, Davis, uh, certainly the youngest of the children. Uh, the ambulance crew was still there. There was about 10 police cars, all the road was blue taped off. It doesn't look like an accident. The paramedics were concerned at the extent of injuries they'd found on Keeley. The position that they'd found her lying in, which is away from the bottom of the stairs. The demeanor of Davis at the time. This very quickly turned into a crime scene rather than a simple death investigation. We needed to learn everything we possibly could about Keeley, which essentially is identifying all the salient points of her, of her life, which was, you know, 30 years of life. We've got to pull all that in together. Well, I was in the army, um, and so we moved around quite a lot. We spent a couple of years in Germany, uh, then back to England, then back to Germany again. Um, so they were move used to moving around, used to moving schools. She was a bit of a tomboy. She had a garage that she liked playing with. Um, she'd always get her garage out when she came home from play school. Played outside a lot. She, she liked being outside. Keely was quite independent, feisty, quite willing to do things on her own. She wanted to go out and work, wasn't in, didn't get on very well with school, um, didn't like authority very much, and so was keen to leave school and make her own way as, as soon as she could, and she did exactly that. There was um, an officer's mess, so she got a job doing waitressing there and she got up every morning at like half past three in the morning to go to work at half past six to put her makeup on. And that was, that was what she needed to do. She loved work. When Keely is 19 years old, she falls hard for her first boyfriend. In her first relationship, she had two children and they were together for three or four years. She met up with what then became her second relationship um, whilst, while she was still involved in the first. And she was very young. Um, so she did have postnatal depression. She did hide it to a certain extent from us. I only found that out a few years ago. She'd moved up to Derbyshire with her second partner, who she went on to marry. Now married, Keely is 150 miles away from her family when the relationship becomes difficult. I just wanted her to come home. She was so far away. I just wanted her to come home. For two years, Keely's close family hear nothing from her. Then one day, she reaches out. She actually made contact with Claire's mum, so her grandmother wanted to come and see her, which we think well, yeah, it was an obvious sort of olive branch, if you like, for us to start mending relationships. So I asked her to ask if I could go and see her as well, because I hadn't seen her for two years. The family's over the moon to be reunited, but a lot has changed in Keeley's life. She has a new partner and a new baby. And she just seemed a lot calmer. She seemed a lot more content. She didn't seem as if she was looking for anything anymore. Her family is relieved to see Keeley happy, but with her difficult relationship history, Keeley appears still vulnerable. In 35-year-old Tony Davis, Keeley seems to have found the partner she needs. We thought, well, she's finally settled. He's, he's providing, she's happy. They've got their family, we can relax. He worked hard, he owned his own business, he owned a number of houses, which of course don't, don't mean that he was a nice guy, but it gives a sense of a, a well-rounded individual. 
her parents. Um, I think they got a sense that he was a stabilising factor. She seemed happy. She'd come and visit us probably once a month. She cooked us a meal while she was here. She'd never done that, even when she was at home. She was never in for meals, she was always out. While speaking to Keeley's parents after their daughter's death, Inspector Fawcett Greaves uncovers what he considers to be the first red flag. Her parents have very little insight into the relationship. Despite being close with Keeley, they had very rarely met Tony Davis. I only met him three times, and each time very briefly. First time was when he dropped Keeley off down here. Keeley had just given birth to their second uh, child. In the years that they were together, he and I were probably in the same room for an hour and a half, two hours, you know, over four years or so. We did a very broad examination of him, his life, his interests, his financial affairs, what his work looked like, what any prior involvement with the police had looked like. The house they lived in was pretty basic. It was small, quite old, not particularly well maintained. It was clean, because Keeley kept it clean. He had a large amount of cash in the bank, and he lived in a very modest and terraced house with the family. It's not for us to judge how a person should spend their money, but the type of person he was, the assets he had available, it did appear strange. The house next door was empty because Keeley said he didn't want to live next door to anybody. Nobody lived next door. She used to just keep all the rubbish next door. Despite their home, Tony and Keeley always appear to have money to burn. He was flash. He, he wanted to present as the successful businessman. He wanted to present as the affluent individual. And that's, that's just how he behaved. Talking about business, and he commented on how much cash his business generates. Um, and, he, and he asked me for my advice on on how he should deal with that cash, um, laundering basically. Um, again, I commented to Claire on the way home as to why he thought I might know how to launder, launder his business cash. Um, we, we laughed about it. So that was the only concern we, that, that we had was over his financial dealings. Detective Inspector Fawcett Greaves has other concerns about Tony Davis. He learns that this is not the first time police have been called to this address. We suspected prior domestic abuse, and there had been at least one prior call to Derbyshire Police regarding a domestic incident between Keeley and Davis. Within hours, Tony Davis becomes the prime suspect in Keeley's murder. Investigators now work to piece together what life was like for her behind closed doors. Keeley was controlled, I think, in every way. Completely hidden to the, to the public eye, financially controlled, emotionally controlled. Uh, he dictated everything that she was allowed to do. Tony never looked like the romantic man. Just what he wanted to do was work, make money, keep uh, having kids. Davis clearly had a lack of respect for Keeley. She was a, a trophy bride, in my opinion. This is how he, he, he treated her. When we was at the Hawthorns once, we parked around the back and he come across just as we was walking in the pub and I don't know what they were screaming at each other at, but he got her pinned up against the wall by her throat. She said that he'd beat her up with a belt. She got a massive bruise on her leg, bruises down her face. He just sat there crying. I don't know if he kicked her in her ribs, but that's where, that's what she ended up calling the ambulance for. The immediately adjacent address is also owned by Davis, and that was kept vacant, which I believe was in order to provide a sound buffer between his activity in the house and the nearest possible neighbors. But in the weeks prior to her death, Keely tells her friends that she's met someone who she believes will help her escape. It made her happy. It made her feel good about herself. All that she ever got off Tony was he'd come home from work, have sex with her, and then go back to work. If you go home or at home, spend every hour at home in fear of a beating or worse, then it's not difficult to imagine that any affection um, would, be, would be welcome. I think it was fairly readily obvious that that relationship was an opportunity for him and a get out for her. Keely phoned me one day saying that Tony rang her, that one of his mates had seen her in a white discovery with a man, 
parked at the side of the road. As soon as Davis became aware that this had taken place, he took himself away. He started planning a trip to Thailand. He went and bought a load of clothes, which certainly presented to me as not the actions of a man that wanted to resolve difficulties in his relationship. He was taunting Keeley over the, uh, by text that that was his plan. He was going away. As Christmas approaches, Keeley drives to Hampshire to visit her family. She came down to take her two older children to the pantomime and for me to look after the three younger ones. She seemed really quiet, <clears throat> not herself, but I thought, you know, she had three children under three and a half. So she'd just driven three hours, got three young children, she's tired. And it wasn't until the Sunday morning, one of her younger children were playing with her phone and she got a text message and I saw it and it implied that she was seeing someone. She left about half past 11 in the morning, said bye, waved, drove off. That was the last time we saw her. On the Wednesday evening, he started texting Claire to say that she had been cheating on him and there'd been an argument. Keely's seeing someone else. I'm distraught. I can't believe it. I'm so upset. I did everything for her. So he then started texting Martin. And to be honest, and this, you know, this, this hurts now knowing, you know, we, my text back to him was quite supportive of him saying, you know, we're, we're, we're here to help. We don't want to interfere, but we're here to help. Tony Davis spends the night drinking in the pub. He's not responding to Keeley's messages. I think around 1 a.m. he decided he was going to confront her about it. There was um, an app that told me where she was because she used to come down, drive down, so I knew where she was in the car and, and things. And the night before, when I went to bed at half past 10, it said she was at home. When I got up the next morning, she wasn't there anymore. I messaged her when I went to work in the morning on WhatsApp, and it only had one tick next to it. I tried to ring her a couple of times. Nothing. So Martin messaged Tony in the morning about quarter past nine, half past nine and said, what's happening? We can't get hold of Keeley. He sent a text back to me immediately, within, within a minute or so, saying, basically agreeing with me, saying, yes, the children, um, it, but everything will be fine. It, it, we'll work this out, was the, was the impression I got. So it was almost like a sigh of relief. Of, OK, so he's going to forgive her for what she's done and they'll be OK and it'll be fine. Just 45 minutes after Tony Davis texts the McGraths to tell them everything is OK, he calls 999. Paramedics arrive at the scene and immediately notice something isn't right. She was on the sofa when the ambulance crew first arrived. How did she get from the bottom of the stairs to there? How did the blood get to the various parts? Why is there broken glass in the kitchen? Why are there family picture frames smashed? Why are there removed on the wall? When officers arrived, they found that Davis was stood holding the youngest child. He appeared to be hiding one of his hands. We subsequently established that was because he got injuries on that hand. He called me up and he's, he said, are you on your own? Are you driving? So the questions he was asking me, I knew I was being set up for some bad news. And I was there to put him on a loudspeaker. I thought the, the bad news was going to be something along the lines of, we, we've split up, I've, or I've kicked her out, or she's, she's left, or something to that effect. And then he said, um, Keely passed away this morning. To which uh, I kind of went, what, what? And he said, she died. And again, I was, I, I kind of didn't, you, you hear it, but don't hear it. And I said, what, 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 what do you mean? He said, Keeda's passed away. I said, sorry, I'm sorry. Keeda's passed away. She's, she's died. She's really hurt herself. And that was just, that was it. It wasn't a long phone call. He was very keen to end the conversation. It was only a few minutes afterwards. I thought that was a that was a very curt and very short conversation to be told your daughter had died. So we asked the question, and we were sort of verbalised what we were thinking to each other. I said, "You don't think it could have been him, do you?" 
He denied any responsibility whatsoever. He maintained his account that she'd fallen down the stairs. She was the one that had the affair. She's the one that broke the family. He blamed her. Once a death is declared as suspicious, which, which happened reasonably quickly, uh, the case is, is, is referred to uh, the Major Crime Unit. Tony Davis generated an account that he had come home in the early hours of the morning and found that Keeley had fallen down the stairs and sustained a series of injuries as a result. The mechanism of injury described by Davis ultimately didn't match the extent of injuries that Keeley had. One of the first things that Davis did uh, around 6 a.m., half past six in the morning, was take the two older children to nursery. He did that, he kept the youngest with him. Didn't take the eight-month-old child, so she was left in the house on her own, laying next to her dead mother. We then got told that her partner was arrested under suspicion of a murder, and then we were driving up to Derbyshire that evening, a three-hour drive there to go and collect the children. And I remember asking the police officer at this point, so I asked him two questions. First of all, was he absolutely sure in their mind that it was murder rather than anything else? And he said, yes, we're sure. And my second question was, are you absolutely sure that it was him? And he said, yes, we're sure. We did a full body map examination of Davis whilst in custody. And what that means is we basically, we look at every square inch of his body to identify any injury. One of his hands was very severely swollen which would be evident uh, if you'd expect someone to have punched somebody repeatedly. It became very obvious that he was never going to admit guilt. Um, and so it was going to go to trial and we were going to have a full trial. By refusing to admit guilt, Davis forces Keeley's family and friends to sit through a trial, listening to the harrowing details of his mental and physical abuse. Keeley had died as a result of a vicious attack. She had 48 separate injuries including, uh, I believe, 14 broken ribs. Both her lungs were punctured. She couldn't breathe, and she bled internally, and she suffered greatly. The degree of her injuries would have meant she was in severe pain, to the point where she would have been crying out. When they were showing all the pictures of all her injuries, he didn't even move, didn't even change his face expression. Subsequent forensic testing did establish that there had been recent sexual contact with Davis. Impossible to time exactly when, but putting all of those features together, I remain convinced that during the course of that attack, Davis raped Keeley. We heard so much horrific detail. To hear that your daughter was raped, and for that not to be the worst thing you heard that day, kind of puts that in perspective. The jury was sent out Friday lunchtime, and we were told, you know, if it, if it comes back quick, it, it could mean it's, it's a guilty verdict. And they didn't come back. Keeley's family had an agonising weekend before the verdict would be given. Then we went back on the Monday morning, and within a couple of hours, I think it was about 11 o'clock, we were called back in. And it was guilty. I very clearly remember seeing Martin and Claire directly in front of me and I saw the weight disappear from their shoulders physically uh, and it was extremely emotional. He got life a minimum of 24 years. I think it, it doesn't bring Keely back, but I think it's more than we, we expected. We could be silly to each other and gross each other out and, and she would respond to it in the same way that I would. So that was fun. I've got a video of her actually in labour with, with the youngest child, and she was in pain but laughing. She laughed, she had a, a funny laugh and shook her head when she laughed. And she's there telling me to stop it and, you know, and just... So I can watch that and it's, it's okay.